Um, yeah, now I have the um, pleasure to introduce our speaker. Um, real quickly, I'll just go over the format of this event. Sister Helen will be speaking for about 30 minutes, and then we will be opening it up to question and answer time. Um, if you have any questions throughout this event, please be sure to direct message them to Gabriella Kirk in the chat. Um, and then we will be uh, either reading your questions or we might invite you to speak as well um, after our speaker has, has her time to speak. All right, so now I will be introducing Sister Helen. Sister Helen Prejean is known around the world for her tireless work against the death penalty. She has been instrumental in sparking national dialogue on capital punishment and in shaping the Catholic Church's vigorous opposition to all executions. She is the author of Dead Man Walking, an eyewitness account of the death penalty in the United States. Dead Man Walking ignited a national debate on capital punishment and inspired an Academy Award winning movie, a play, and an opera. Sister Helen works with the people of all faiths and those who follow no established faith, but her voice has had a special resonance with her fellow Catholics. Please join me in welcoming Sister Helen Prejean. Thank you. Glad to be with you. I'm Southern and I have a Southern accent, but I can talk fast because I got a lot of stories I want to share with you and a lot of sharing I want to do with you. Nothing could be better than to have a program to educate people in prison. If there's one thing we know about the whole prison system and when people don't go back, it's when they get an education. Like take Louisiana, ex-slave state, over 70% people in our prison in Louisiana State Penitentiary, the largest in the country, over 70% African-American, average educational level, seventh grade. Education means so much because you begin to get a sense of your identity and who you are, what your gifts are, um, and how you could be an agent in your own life and of change. So it's so great what you're doing. I love what you're doing. I love Northwestern for a lot of reasons. I love Illinois for a lot of reasons. You know, you put down the death penalty in Illinois. You have a great hero in your state that I got to know personally, uh, George Ryan. I mean, that was a real journey of conscience that man made because he had signed into law, put, putting the death penalty back in Illinois. And here he is, the governor and here are people coming into his office after the 12th one came, Northwestern School of Journalism, and a great journalist got in there and started doing an investigation on all these cases. Oops, you made a mistake. Oops, you made a mistake. Oops, you made a mistake. And we are now at a point in this country where 182 wrongfully convicted people have managed to get off a of death row. Some by sheer luck, grace of God, good investigators, lawyers, all kinds of stuff where the prosecutors didn't destroy the rape kit or the, the DNA kit. Um, and now 182, we've executed over 1500 people. Would you get on an airline where they told you, now look, we have to give you this little alert. You have a one in eight chance that the plane isn't gonna make it. Now we wish you well when you get on our airline. For every eight people executed, one person's had to be freed because they made a mistake. Overwhelmingly, it's been due to prosecutorial misconduct. Prosecutors have the evidence. Prosecutors get the original police report. And now there is spreading around this country the conviction integrity units. Our DA in New Orleans, Louisiana. Louisiana, we killed eight people in eight and a half weeks. We had the busiest death row. And now we have an African-American DA, Jason Williams. He's got a conviction integrity unit in the DA's office in New Orleans. And he announced when he ran and he got elected, I'm not going for the death penalty. And the truth is nobody gets executed unless prosecutors seek death. They have to make a decision to seek death at trial. They have to continue through the state to pursue that death penalty all the way to the end through the appeals. If they don't choose to seek death, nobody dies. So the conviction integrity units 
helping prosecutors look at and to be aware of the political pressure that operates within them. Sometimes, I mean, we could just show the statistics that when prosecutors were up, they were seeking a higher office or they were up for reelection, the death penalties would increase. Because what was the rhetoric? What was it in the 80s? Tough on crime, tough on crime, tough on crime. What well, could be tougher than you kill somebody, you die. And the thinking, thinking, of course, at first was, well, what could be a greater deterrent than self-preservation? Hey, maybe I better not kill this person or witness because I could die. And surely that would restrain murderers from killing people. There was only one thing wrong, and we can talk about that. But if there's one thing we know now, death penalty doesn't deter anybody. The states that have the most violence and do the most more death penalties than others don't have a lower violence rate at all. And as the police chiefs in two different polls that were taken of police chiefs where they were given a list of 10 remedies to deter violence and murders, all put the death penalty dead last. Because for the death penalty to serve as a deterrent, somebody about to murder somebody has to think of consequences. And as the police chief said, the people doing the thinking and the people doing the murder and two different sets of people. Because most murders happen in this situation, something goes wrong, you got a gun, you're high on drugs. As the warden at the Louisiana State Penitentiary told me one time, he said, sister, you know who by and large makes our best trustees what crime they originally came into prison for? And it was murder. He said, they didn't know when they got up that morning, they were gonna murder somebody. Something went awry. It's not all these evil people intentionally seeking to go kill people. And so I've been learning about the death penalty from the very beginning when I got involved. And that, that story is in Dead Man Walking. And uh, I'm a Catholic nun. I taught seventh and eighth graders religion and English. I knew Jack about the criminal justice system. I led prayer groups in the parish, okay? I'm a bona fide nun. What did I know? But, and I'll just tell you a little bit about this book. This is waking up and becoming an activist. And I had to break out of two cocoons. By the way, the last page of this book about my waking up to justice is the first page of Dead Man Walking. So I had to break out of two cocoons. One was the spiritual cocoon where good done that I am, prayerful as I am. I thought if I prayed to God for the big problems of the world, I was God's problem. And I'd make statements like, I'm apolitical. I don't get involved in all that messy politics. I'm spiritual. I'm above all that. So praying to God to help the homeless people, the people in prison, a disconnected spirituality from real on the ground suffering people. And that it's, it's called the lightning chapter in River of Fire. When I, when I woke up to the radical dimension of the gospel of Jesus. Not how poor Jesus is weaponized and screwed around by religion. I mean, he's made to be in favor of separating children from their parents at the border. I mean, poor Jesus. I love to quote Holden Caulfield from Catcher in the Rye. You know, he's a teenage kid kind of trying to find his way. And he said, poor Jesus, if he come back today and see what was done, do, being done in his name, he would puke. And, um, what Jesus? Well, I had to wake up too to the radical call of the Christian gospel, which is much more about just being charitable to people around me uh, and praying for people. But it was to get in there and be in solidarity and the struggles with people. So the second cocoon I had to break out of was my cocoon of white privilege, being in the suburbs, practicing charity, teaching people, but 10 major housing projects in New Orleans in the inner city. And I didn't feel a need to go to any of them. What was my connection with struggling African-American people in my own city? We are on the cusp right now of a huge awakening in this country because everybody in their homes, COVID may have contributed to this. And watching that nine minutes and 29 seconds of that that officer Chauvin's knee on the neck of George Floyd and seeing the life squeezed out of him. Kaboom, we witness it. There's a saying in Latin America, what the eyes don't see, 
the heart can't feel. We witnessed it as a nation. And that brave little 17-year-old girl with that iPhone, and she kept taking that video, even though Chauvin was threatening to taser her, she kept taking that video, and we saw it. And our seeing of it is what has helped to awaken our hearts. And then the debate begins. So right away, oh, well, he was just a rogue. He was a bad apple. You're always going to have some bad apples. Uh-uh. And the experience of African-American people for all these years in this country with the police is rising up. Black Lives Matter has made a huge difference. Taking down the heroes of the Confederacy, the statues, is making a difference. We're beginning to recognize more and more as a nation the legacy of slavery that has infected every single system in our country. I had to wake up to my own white privilege as well. And so waking up to white privilege out in the suburbs, I moved into the St. Thomas Housing Projects and began to live among African-American people who were my servants when I was growing up. I lived in, during the Jim Crow days, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in the 40s and 50s. I never knew African-American people as my peers. This couple worked for my mom and daddy, Ellen, I never knew her last name. And Jesse never knew his last name. He worked in the yard, Ellen worked in the house. He had a big two-story house where the white people lived. My daddy was a moderately successful lawyer. And here they are in the servants' quarters behind and charitable, kind to him. Daddy even helped Ellen and Jesse buy property, helped Jesse get a good job at the refinery, get a house, but never questioned Jim Crow because we never suffered from Jim Crow. I've never personally suffered from the police pulling me over. I do have something of a, I mean, a bad record for getting speeding tickets. And I've gotten some speeding tickets and sometimes I could talk myself out of it, sometimes playing the nun card, but not. But here I'm a white woman in Louisiana and I'm never scared that the police are gonna do something to me. And when I moved into the St. Thomas Housing Project, it's like it was like moving into another country, the other America, because all the rules were different. How you're treated by the police when you don't have health care and you bring your sick child to charity hospital at 11 at night and have to wait till three in the morning to some tired little intern from Tulane Medical School or LSU is going to come and attend to your child because you don't have medical care and you can't go to a doctor. Kids coming in to the adult learning center to get their GED. They were juniors in high school in the public schools and couldn't read a third grade reader. And I was part, you know, of that two track system. I was with the Catholic schools. I was with the private schools. And you can live in this, you can live in this and be good people. I wasn't a bad person. My mom and daddy weren't bad people. But boy, culture gives us eyes and ears. And so when we go to say what's going on and how we interpret reality, we bring our experience with us. And that's what happened to me. So then moving into St. Thomas, what happened is I began to learn everything. I began keeping notes in my journal. I read the life of Martin Luther King because I was ready. I was ready to learn. I had everything to learn. Uh, taking this... Uh, this workshop called Undoing Racism, learn the difference between prejudice, racism, prejudice, any individual can be prejudiced against another person. You know, a black person could be prejudiced against an individual white person, but racism is that prejudice combined with institutional power. That affects redlining and where you get a loan in the bank, where you buy a house in the neighborhood and more and more and more and more and more is being exposed now of how racism has determined every single institution in this country and is still at work, but we're waking up. People are good. We are good people and waking up. And that's why they be able to get an education like you're getting is just an event. We always are gonna be learning, always gotta be learning. And so what happened then while I was working at Hope House, and this, in a way, is such almost a fluke. It was just like, I come out one day 
And I get an invitation to write a man on death row. So I was learning about every aspect of the justice system, see? And so I said, sure, I could write to somebody on death row. I never dreamed that person was going to be executed. This was the early 80s. It had been an unofficial moratorium on death penalty. It was in the 60s, 70s. I think I could write some nice letters. I'm an English major. I could write a poem or two, you know. Have a nice little correspondence going with this person. And two years later, a little over two years later, I am in that execution chamber when he is killed, when he is executed, where he is strapped into a wooden chair and had electricity pumped through his body and he was killed. The anniversary of his death actually was, it was on April the 5th. It was right after midnight of the 4th. I was just remembering that. Would you believe 37 years ago, but it blazes in my heart like a fresh fire because of what I witness. It's what I see. In fact, in, our, in River of Fire, it's the prelude. It's the fire part of the book because it goes, they killed a man with fire one night. They strapped him in a wooden chair and pumped electricity through his body until he was dead. His killing was a legal act because he had killed. No religious leaders protested the killing that night, but I was there. I saw it with my own eyes. And what I saw set my soul on fire, a fire that burns in me still. And now here's an account of how I came to be in the killing chamber that night and the spiritual currents that drew me there. So that's a fire in me. I got to do this work. I cannot not do this work. I've been one of those witnesses they got brought close in, in the secret ritual. You never, when you had the death penalty in Illinois, you were never gonna witness an execution. And there've been two court cases where they've tried to make executions public and they've been both been defeated. So by design, it's a secret ritual. The fuel of witnesses go in to see what it actually means now when the government takes a live human being and straps them down and renders them defenseless and kills them. And once you do see that, you cannot unsee that. You know, Brian Stevenson, boy, his word, his great word is proximity. What do you have proximity to? What do you have close encounter with? You know, that's what we know. That's what breaks open things for us and how we learn. So that experience and coming out of that execution chamber in the middle of the night, throwing up, I'd never in my life witnessed anything like this. When you watch an intentional protocol of death, step by step by step, and then the person you've known for two years, then you see that life taken from them. It changes you. And I realized, I said, I'm a witness. How I got thrown into all this, but I'm a witness. And my job is to tell the story and I have a moral imperative to me. And I've been in and out all over this country for the low these years talking to the American people. And that's what led me to write Dead Man Walk. And I wrote it when I wrote it and it came out in 1993, 80% of the American public supported the death penalty. The paperback came out in 94. Susan Sarandon read the paperback. You never know. Once you write a book and you put it out there, it's like a child. It's going to go wherever it wanted to go. So Demi Walker wanted to go into the lap of Susan Sarandon. I've heard other people say, hmm, lucky book. At any rate, she's the one who made that movie happen. That woman's determination, because she knew we needed another kind of film in this country. There had been formulaic kind of films about the death penalty. whole thing was, did he do it? Did he do it? Is he guilty? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, he did it. Last scene, execution, justice is served. Some crimes by their nature deserve the death penalty. And then we start getting into descending into how the death penalty was set up in Gregory, Georgia. And you know what really laid bare like a laser beam? The fundamental flaw in the way Greg v. Georgia, the Supreme Court, set up the death penalty had been the 13 killings from Trump and Barr. It laid it bare because for 17 years, 
there had been no execution on federal death row. Suddenly, here you had Attorney General Barr announcing in July that there would be 13 executions. And they killed them all. They did it. They set out. It's like shooting cans off a fence. Named them, went after them, and killed them. And what did it expose? The fundamental flaw in Greg v. Georgia, impossible criteria. They were trying to give guided discretion to the jurors that you're not supposed to be given the death penalty willy-nilly like being struck by lightning. It was arbitrary and capricious, which made him overturn it in 72. Now we're going to have guidelines. We're going to have more, more restricted guidelines for the jurors. So what did they put as the guideline? Only for the worst of the worst. Only the worst of the worst. So don't give the death penalty for your ordinary murders, your garden variety murders. Nobody knows what it means. And so you have a fuzzy criteria and then they coupled it with complete discretion from prosecutors to seek it or not. So is anybody surprised that over 75 of actual executions that have happened in the modern era have happened in the former slave states where race plays so much a part and where the local culture and who gets elected to office that tough on, on uh, crime policies in the deep south states, the penal system, a direct result of when slaves were freed. Is anybody surprised about how worst of the worst in actuality is going to turn out in this country and you see the profile only poor people selected for death overwhelmingly did you kill a white person and who's outraged over the death of the victim or is it a person of color and there's not a blip on the screen in terms of outrage over the death of black lives because white lives matter in this country more and nowhere does that show up more than when you have somebody who's been murdered and who cares. And the other deep wound, I think, that is exposed in the death penalty is that killing killers to try to set a moral example that we can't have killing. It's using violence. It's using the worst possible human behavior and imitating it. And then promising that to the victim's family. I hope you don't have to wait 15 years or longer, but what we're going to give you, what we're going to do for you, the way we're going to honor your dead loved one is we're going to execute the one who killed your loved one and you get to watch it. And that's going to give you peace. It's going to give you closure. Can it? So more and more, as we've been growing and understanding and waking up as a country, and there are definite shifts. I mean, to see that Virginia the first former state of the Confederacy just shut down the death penalty. And then you look at the forces moving in the, in the country that made that possible. Virginia, where Charlottesville happened, where you had Trump saying, oh, there's good on both sides with the white supremacists and then the people opposing them and they're you know, upholding white supremacy. Confederate statues coming down, Black Lives Matter killing of George Floyd, then the conviction integrity units in prosecutor's office. There were two prominent prosecutors in Virginia that stood up, people of conscience. Individuals make a difference in this, the moral struggle. It stood up and said, I will no longer seek the death penalty. It is so racist in Virginia. They killed the most people, 1,400 executions over 400 years. Since 1806, Virginia had been killing people. And Virginia just shut the death penalty down. And before them, Illinois put the death penalty down. You were one of the first. You were right in there. Why did you shut it down? Well, George Ryan played a role in that. And I just got to hold him up. I'm just getting ready. They're, I'm going to sign 30 books of um, death of innocence about innocent people. And then George Ryan's book and my book, Death of Innocence, is going to be sent to 30 governors around this country, encouraging them to be moral leaders and to help their state become a true life state. 
And George Ryan's, I mean, he's so, I, I really love this man. He really went through a lot. I mean, he had a real change of conscience because he had, he had put the death penalty back in, in Illinois. He had been one of the legislators that signed it in. So here he is, the governor, doing his little governor's job, being in his little governor's office, life's bumping along. First guy comes in, fed from Northwestern. I mean, hey, look at the role you have played and that the journalism students did it. The investigators getting in there, I love it. The part that writers can play. One person comes in George Ryan's office, made a mistake. Second person, third person. By the time you got to the 12th person and Anthony Porter stood in there and that was a lucky little son of a gun that Anthony Porter, but he had the journalism students were on it and the investigators, they had to try to get this box of the original police report, which prosecutors are in control of all this. And the last box in this huge warehouse and they open it up and lo and behold, there was the original police report, which showed that all along there had been another suspect. And it was able then to show Anthony Porter did not do it. And after, I don't know how many years he was on death row, then there he is in Governor Ryan's office. And by the time they got to Anthony Porter, Ryan recognized there's a systemic flaw in this system. And he tried to propose two bills of reform to the legislature and they didn't go for it. And then he made his act of conscience. He met with victims' families. He knew it was gonna be hard because what they were promised, see what they were given, this thing they were holding on to was that they were gonna get to see the execution of the one who had killed their loved one. And when you're in grief and in you're in trauma and you're in, all over the place and chaos in your life. And you offered something that's gonna make you feel better. Of course they go for it. He met with them and took in their anger, their disappointment, that if he commuted those sentences and deprived them of their justice, what if somebody had killed your daughter? He took all that in and then he made his decision. And his decision to commute every sentence included someone who had brutally killed his next door neighbor. He said, I couldn't commute every sentence, but then see, I was personally affected by this death and I'd make an exception. It, it had to be everyone and he did it. And that really helped Illinois. And it, it was a big thing. It was a big current that pushed the wave to the shore. And if you look around you, you can see Amnesty International says the first thing you watch for when there's a social change, when there's a change in consciousness and conscience is you watch practice. Who's actually doing it? Not the rhetoric, not the political rhetoric, but change in practice. And juries are not handing out the death sentence anymore, even in Texas, Texas, Harris County, you know, Houston, that, that county, they were responsible single-handedly every year for 48 death sentences, none. One of the factors was the jury had to be given real information about what sentence a person would get if they didn't give them death. So just think for a while, put yourself in the shoes of jurors. There's been a terrible murder in the community and they would actually send a note to the judge saying, if we don't give them death, because they know they got to protect the community, right? If we don't give them death, what will be the sentence? And they wouldn't tell them. So they had this huge vacuum and they'd give the death penalty. It, in a way, it was all they could do. But then when they're given real information, that if you don't give a death sentence, that person's going to be in prison for life and society can be safe boy, the death penalty start dropping away because people don't want to be personally responsible for being responsible for the death of a fellow citizen. I mean, you know, and all kinds of stories are coming out now about jurors and participating in these juries, giving in to pressure, voting with a unanimous decision, and then afterwards, you know, conscience stricken and, and the whole bit. Um, and so... George Ryan, you have individuals in a society that stand up 
and they make a difference in the whole. And now what we can see happening with, with the George Floyd thing is for the first time you have a police department, you know, the blue wall, the solid blue wall of loyalty of the police just got broken because you had the head of the police saying that was wrong what Officer Chauvin did. He used undue force, even if that, that, that man handcuffed behind his back and not putting up any resistance and he's quiet there in the ground and he stayed on his neck. So when these things happen and we witness it, shifts happen. And that's how we change. Catholic Church took 1300 years of dialogue for the Catholic Church to reach a moral position where just in August, 2018, Pope Francis changed the official teaching catechism of the Catholic Church that under no circumstances can you ever allow a government to take the life of its citizens. For long, up until that point in the teachings in the Catholic Church, other Christian churches pretty much like this too. You got to give the state the right to take life because that's how you're going to keep order in a society. Now, you got to remember the long history. There were times when you didn't have prisons, yet you needed the government to, to take violent means to protect society, but it was always defense of society. In the Catholic Church teaching, it was never, there are some crimes by their very nature, there are some people by their very character that are so evil that we must do to them what they did to their victim, that justice demands. We imitate it and we do to them, never that. But life changes, we get prisons. And the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights happens in 1948. Eleanor Roosevelt played a big role in that. And when I went to St. Thomas and was living there and living at Hope House, these are all my teachers. See, I didn't know anything about universal declaration, inalienable human rights. Simply because you're a person, you got this right. The right to life, Article 3, inalienable. Which means governments don't give you that right for good behavior. And governments can't take that right away for bad behavior, the right to life, inalienable. You can never put governments in charge of deciding they're gonna be some crimes in which they, the government, will take the life of their citizens. That was a long time in coming. That's a lot of dialogue. And it's also societal structural change. We begin to develop prisons. We develop a criminal justice system that's still woefully lacking but we are seeing a huge change in our consciousness going on now about penal reform. Why are we sending kids to prison for these long sentences? Why are we putting people in prison for long sentences for nonviolent crimes like drugs? You can just see it. You can, you can sense it. You can sense the consciousness rising. And it's great to be a part of it because we are awake. And when you're awake, then we have the moral responsibility then to participate. It's a blessed thing to be awake. And in my book I wrote in River Fire, I was 40 blooming years old before I was awake to justice as integral to the gospel of Jesus. Not just feeling sorry for people or being charitable to them. Though we need charity, we will always need to have the food lines for people who are hungry. We will always need charity. But justice is deeper than charity. And justice means we look at the systemic wrong and we begin to address it. Check out the infrastructure bill that is now going to be presented before Congress. And infrastructure, a lot more than just roads and bridges and stuff. The people as the infrastructure. When 20% of all students are in poverty, the schools, look at the difference the women uh, Janet Yellen, the women that are connected with treasury, uh, trade, are now presenting that the care community is also part of the infrastructure. The people who take care of seniors, the women in the home that take care of the children, and they're expanding it and deepening it, that that too, how do we support 
those people. Now, some people are going to say, oh, that's a stretch. When we talk about infrastructure, we only talk about roads, bridges, and airports. Well, what about broadband? People in rural communities don't have broadband and they can only have access to the internet. They were interviewing people in a rural community in Virginia the other day about whether or not they were getting a vaccine. And they said, we don't have, I don't even have a, commute, a, com a computer. Uh, Elaine ain't getting it, Eddie ain't getting it, I'm not getting it, and my Aunt Lou ain't getting it, the vaccine. Don't tell me about that vaccine. How are they gonna even get information if you don't have broadband and you don't have access to information? Not even to get on to register. So there's just a lot of stuff that's right now. It's just like spring in a lot of ways. And we got a long way to go, but we are putting the death penalty down. And I raised, if I had a hat, I would take it off to Illinois as being a part of some of one of the first in the movement to show that a state could put it down. And you didn't go to the dogs. Suddenly the murders didn't take over the whole state and start killing people. And so anyway, that's my opening salvo. And now we can talk about anything you want to talk about. Thank you so much, Sister Helen. Yes, I'm gonna do my clap emoji. Thank you so much. We do have some questions for you. The first question that we have is, what actions can we do as students and young people to make a difference and advocate against the death penalty? Take a look. Now you gotta do your own digging, you know? I'm not gonna give you a list of the four things you go out and you go do, right? Part of being a person of justice means you got to do some digging and find out where that spark hits your heart. Penal reform is huge. Cook County Jail had some of the most abuse in the country that went on there. And so you look at the penal system of, of that's, going, that's happening in Illinois and dig in there. That's one suggestion you can do. Another, juveniles. And what, what is happening with at-risk kids so they don't go into juvenile prison? All of these are waiting for you. And you know, the whole universe, you know how the whole universe works? Is the principle of attraction. It's the way gravity from the, the flaring forth of the first big bang and how the molecules adhere together. It's why people get married to each other. It is the principle of attraction, and that is true for justice too, about what attracts your heart. Is it kids? Is it seniors? Is it, and follow that. But you gotta do your digging. You gotta do your exploring. So that's my answer to you. Awesome, thank you. All right, our next question. Um, how do you conceive of the relationship between death penalty abolition and prison abolition more broadly? Are there potential tensions between the two um, or, you do, or do you see them as working in tandem? Life is tension. It's always gonna be tension. You could see the death penalty as the apex of the whole penal system. Even that the government could kill you if they decided your crime was bad enough or you were evil enough. But, but we have the highest incarceration rate in the world. I mean, and the more I, because I've known people in prison, I've seen this system up close. It's a system of exile. It's a system of breaking up families. Where do we get on this huge punishment kick? Definitely it's related to freeing slaves. And where were the plantation owners going to get their workers? There are great books written on this, slavery by any other name, and how there would be like rules, like uh, uh, laws, uh, like loitering, a black person would be put in jail, serve time in jail, go to get out of jail, and oh, you owe us for food and for lodging, and they're sent to a work camp and they're never heard of again. So there's, and we still call Louisiana State Penitentiary the farm, it's 18,000 acres. And if you ever go to our penitentiary, you see men with hose over their shoulders and a horse, a, a guard on horseback at the front of the column with a gun and the back of the column of men with the, on horse back with a gun. And it's still a farm, two and a half cents an hour you make when you first go into Louisiana prison. 
punishment, exile, and cheap labor. And you look at the 13th Amendment when slavery was abolished, except for those incarcerated. It is built into the system. So, but look, you can begin to see what's the new word out and about in the land. Restorative justice, not just punitive justice. Exiling people from their family, imposing pain on them, making them suffer. How does that restore anything? How does it help our society to be whole? That's a direction. It's just a great time to be alive because these things are just breaking open. And we need creative people getting in and getting involved to help it happen. So there'll be a tension. In the beginning, always it was, well, if you say you're against the death penalty, do you believe in life without the possibility of parole? And, and very early on, you know, when I was asked that question, I did not advocate it, but I knew one thing that people needed in the beginning was to be assured that people were not going to get out and kill again. And so I would say the alternative that can happen is life without parole. Now I don't talk about it like that anymore. And as Pope Francis or as any person who believes in the wholeness of human beings and that people are always more than their worst act is that people can be restored. I mean, you know, with the, what that warden told me that, you know, people come in here for murder who didn't know they were going to murder anybody that morning. They get in the prison discipline. They begin to read books. They get a little education. They get a skill. And they're not going to kill anymore. But yet we have a geriatric ward. We have a hospice unit at our prison in Louisiana because they're old, old people there because... They have not been able to get out. Now with a, we have a democratic governor, we're getting, beginning to have some reform of letting people out on parole, you know, who have been, who've been 40 years in prison, 40 years. So these are some changes. So yeah, there'll always be tension, but the main thing is people need information about how they can be safe. And once you, this is what I've found, in these 30 plus years of dialogue with the American people about the death penalty. Most people do not think about these issues very much. Anything having to do with prison, much less the death row, because it doesn't touch them personally. Most people don't have people on death row. Or most Americans don't have people in prison. Bring them close and help them reflect. And that's why the book being made into a film made such a difference because the film plowed the ground as Tim and I, Robbins and I would say, the film plows the ground, it leads people to the book and the book tills the soil. I found out a book is a powerful thing. I used to think books were passive because I'm from Louisiana. We talk to each other. We eat crawfish out in the backyard for three hours eat that ball of crawfish and drink those long neck beers and you talk to each other in Louisiana. I thought a book, yeah, it's just got to be there on the shelf. You can't even have a little finger come out and say, hey, read me. Hey. I thought of it as passive. I didn't know the power of a book. Because when you're reading a book and you're quiet and you're using your imagination and then you're going in that desk into the execution chamber with me, you're going with me over to visit that victim's family and to hear their hurt. And you ask the question, what could heal them? What could do it? You know, and me, what's helpful was as Tim Robbins was working on the film, he kept saying, the nun is in over her head. Well, and I was, what did I know? And I found out that can be a gift because people read that book, they go, that nun doesn't know what she's doing. Instead of an expert coming to your page one, here's all about the death penalty. Let this sister teach you now. If you never had tons, nuns teach you in school here, here are the lessons you need. And then they start resisting and they shut the book but you get in there with somebody who doesn't know what they're doing, then they can come with you and they can learn with you. So a book I found out was very powerful. Then we have a film out there and it got four nominations. I just called Susan Sarandon on March 25th was the anniversary of the Academy Awards when she got the Academy Award. 
And I called him. I said, hey, Susan, guess what anniversary it is? Remember that night in Los Angeles? And you stepped up there breathless, said, I want to thank. I want to thank. And she got the Academy Award for portraying a nun. The only time she ever played a nun's role and got the Blooming Academy Award for it. And then that just brought the, it brought the book around the world, 10 translations, different languages, and it's still operative to this day. I give talks in universities and schools and with groups. They can do the, the film first, plow the ground, then people can read the book, descend deeply into it. What I have found out about the American people in the death penalty is get people to reflect on it, give them even a modicum of information about it, and people reject it. They're not, they're really not for having the government kill people when they know they can't even get the potholes filled. I mean, how are you gonna trust your government about life and death? So the arts are very important. And then there is a blooming opera of Dead Man Walking. I mean, it's been performed in Chicago at the Lyric Opera. It's gonna be at the Met. It's gonna be at the blooming Met in New York. So the COVID set it back a year or two, but it's gonna be in 2022. And it is a powerful opera. See, we so used to our operas as museum pieces and about a long wait time and all this stuff, you know, but it's very well done. Terrence McNally, a real wonderful playwright, he died just a year and a half ago, did the libretta, the drama, and then this new, new composer, Jake Hagee, did the composing. And it's, it's really, really great. My character, guess what my aria is? My journey about making my way, trying to find my way through the whole thing. So you got the arts out there and um, bring it on. And they're making a graphic novel of Dead Man Walking. It's gonna be a, not a comic book, but a graphic novel working with the illustrator now she's in Sweden. And she's wonderful. I'm looking at the stuff going, wow, look at that scene. It's amazing. All right, who else got a question? Question or comment? Absolutely. That is fantastic. Next question that we've got. Um, what message do you have for Catholics who support the death penalty? Dig into the Gospels. Give me a few Jesus quotes where Jesus said, yeah, execute them. Of course, poor Jesus. There was this woman in the legislature, Wyoming, okay? This just happened a year and a half ago. They have one vote away from repealing the death penalty in Wyoming. They haven't executed anybody in 1400 years. They got two people on death row. It's a political statement of some of their politicians. They're about to repeal it. They come to her and she said, no, I'm not voting for a repeal because if Jesus hadn't been executed by the Romans, we wouldn't be saved from our sins. What kind of theology, what kind of understanding, what's the image of God in that? That this God of wrath, has had his, got to be male, sense of justice offended and only the death of a son. You kill, you die, you pay for your sins. And believe me, I mean, sometimes I just go, we can only go up with religion. I mean, it's just been, no wonder a lot of people don't want to go to church because they just see the religion so misused in so many ways. But the heart of the gospel is vibrant and about life. Can y'all see over my shoulder over there that calligraphy? It's Korean. Uh, when I was in Seoul, they had a famous calligrapher and, and he asked me, what's your favorite quote from the scriptures? And I'll do a calligraphy for you. And I, I told him, and there it is. And it's from Jesus. I've come that you may have life. Jesus never even used the word savior. It was about being alive, fully alive. And to be a spiritual being is to be fully alive and compassion. And that's at the heart of every, every spiritual tradition. Do you have more compassion? Are you able to get inside the skin and life and sufferings of other people or not and bond with them? Are you a separator? Or do you divide people? 
oh, they're, we're in, they're out, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And so it's just a, a time where, I mean, so Catholics, first of all, the Catholics, what do you think is behind the Pope on August 2018, finally coming to this place that, that we cannot give the government, you know, the right, you got to dig into those teachings, see? Changing documents is one thing. Living out of them is something else. But you don't just look at Catholics. I'm speaking to my fellow Catholics now. You don't just look at documents of the church. You get into the gospel of Jesus. And what is the good news of that gospel? And that was a turning point for me when I broke through that spiritual cocoon where I said, oh, well, I pray for people. I don't get involved with domestic politics. And I heard this talk. It's called the lightning chapter in the book. And I heard this talk. I mean, one good talk can do you in change the spiritual trajectory of your life because this sister who was giving us a talk on justice and the gospel of Jesus said Jesus preached good news to the poor I thought I knew what she was going to say next about how every hair of your head is numbered God so loves you you can call God Abba like daddy not just father and she said integral to the good news to people who are poor it's not God's will for you to be poor you have a right to struggle for what is rightfully yours. It's the dignity of the person. And I, I wasn't struggling with anybody for what was rightfully theirs. I was just saying some prayers that God was going to help these people, but I wasn't doing anything. And boom, it cracked me open. And I came home from that conference, and that's when I moved into the St. Thomas Housing Projects in New Orleans, and then had African-American people become my teachers. Awesome. Thank you for that answer. Um, I'm going to see if someone who has written a question wants to jump in and say their question to you directly. Um, Jacob Munoz, Ooh, are you brave person. here? Brave person. We're going to hear your voice. What's your name? Hi, yes. Um, my name is Jacob Munoz. Um, again, uh, my question for you is, um, what sort of arguments against the death penalty have you found in your life to be most persuasive to those in the crowd that might be the most hesitant to accept those ideas? And do you find that it's easier or harder at this point in your, in your life at, at this time in our nation's history to change people's minds on, on criminal justice reform? Definitely it's easier now because they can see like, hey, Virginia did away from the death penalty. Hey, look at all the mistakes. See, we didn't have that in the beginning. And I myself personally thought Jacob, that it was going to be a fluke if we made a mistake, because I thought we had the best court system in the world with all the appeals. I had no idea how broken it was, even in its structure, and that only poor people were going to be selected in it. So I take different approaches depending on who I'm talking to, but uh, picture this, a gymnasium with a thousand high school boys in it. It doesn't matter that they're Catholic. It's a Jesuit school. You got all them little testosterones swarming around in that gym. And I know to talk to a thousand boys is different from talking to a thousand girls because they're males. And you, you know, they got that thing of, man. So often the, the way I'll approach it with them or people that I know are for the death penalty, not just them, is I'll start with all the arguments about why you ought to be for the death penalty. And I'll Look at the nature of this crime. Think of this victim's family. They woke up that morning and their life was normal. And now for the rest of their life, they are going to deal with this terrible atrocity. Look what happened to that victim. An innocent person in our society whose life was taken. Sometimes I give the argument that I've heard from victim's family. I will not be satisfied even with him having life without parole because he's still alive. He's in prison, but he's still alive. And my daughter is dead and married, buried in the ground forever. And that's not fair. The only way to make it fair is that he's got to lose his life because she, he took her life. Or you hear prosecutors in their closing arguments at trial, death penalty trials, don't feel for his human rights. He didn't respect the human rights of his victims. Why should we respect his? And then you got to then take them 
feel the outrage with them. And I'll just say at this point, you never would have heard of the book Dead Man Walking if I hadn't had this great editor at Random House who helped me shape the story. Because in the beginning, my first draft, it was all about the human rights of the person being executed that should be done and all that. All the energy, all the emphasis was on that. And Jason Epstein looks at that draft and he said, you wait far too long before you talk about the victims and the suffering. Nobody's going to read your book. They're going to say, well, she's a nun. She believes in Jesus. She's not going to be able to face the horror of what that guy did, that first guy on death row that I was with, Patrick Sonier, whose anniversary of his, his execution was just two days ago. He and his brother in cold blood had killed a teenage couple, shot him in the back of the heads with a 22 rifle and the bodies are found lying in a harvested sugar cane field way out in the, in the, in the, in the fields of Louisiana. That's what he did. Well, what about them? And what about their family? And so Jason helped me. He said, in the first 10 pages, you stand straight on and look at the horror of the crime. And you, the, your reader knows you feel the outrage of it too. And then your job is to then take them into to that execution chamber at the end and along the way, let them get information about how the death penalty really works. Who gets it, who doesn't, who benefits from it, like the politicians. All you gotta do when you're running for office in Louisiana, is say you were for the death penalty. If any opponent dare to say you're not, they were seen as weak. This past presidential campaign and election is the first time we had people running for president who said they were against the death penalty first time. Obama didn't do it either. He had his design of death penalty too. This was the first. So when you see leaders now doing this, it means there's been a rise in the consciousness of the people. And that's us. That's what's going on right here. That's what really makes change. So you got to take people through. Oh, and another big one is they say, I'm not spending my taxpayers' money on giving food and lodging three hots and a cot to that person for the rest of their life. That's got to be more expensive. All you need is a few little chemicals and let's put them away forever. And they have no idea of how the death penalty, the capital crimes in a system, how expensive it is and why it roughly is double the cost of life without parole. You got to build a special section of the prison. You have appeals all the way to the end as the defense lawyers say, I'm gonna take every appeal I can to the courts until the very end. Are they gonna kill my client? Normally in cases, you're not gonna have people take their appeals all the way to the end till you can't appeal anymore. But when they're gonna kill your client and who's paying for that? The taxpayers on both sides of the bench, paying the judge's time, paying the lawyer, the defense time, paying the you know, because all these people are poor and it's all the taxpayers money's doing, doing this whole thing. So those are some of the, you gotta take people there, you know, and you gotta say, can't we be safe? And then when you get right into the moral heart, uh, you're really coming close to getting to the heart also of what torture means. Because the UN Convention Against Torture is an extreme mental, a physical assault on someone rendered defenseless. And it's the taking of that person from their cell and they're defenseless and you strap them down and you kill them. And mental assault, I've been with six people who've been executed. They all have the same nightmare. The guards are coming for me. It's my time. I'm struggling, I'm kicking. No, they're dragging me out of my cell. And then I wake up, I look around, it was a dream. Not now, but it'll come later. Mental assault. What it could be a greater mental assault is we're coming to kill you. Or like Dobie Gillis Williams brought to the death house three times, getting within an hour of death, only to get a last minute stay of execution, be brought back to his cell, then brought back in the death house. 
it, to the deaf house. Finally, on the third time, he said, I need it to be over. I can't keep making my legs work. What could be a greater mental assault than to say, we're going to kill you? Oh, no, not tonight. So you bring people close. Jacob, did that answer it for you? You got a further question. No, I answered it perfectly. Uh, thank you so much for your response. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for your good question. Awesome. Um, we have another question. Laura S., would you like to unmute and ask your question? Sure. Um, Sister Helen, it is such an honor. Um, thank you so much for Good speaking evening. today. Um, I was wondering if you could share a little bit of what you've learned from the prisoners that you have befriended and, and worked with. Oh, man. I'm on my seventh one now. And he is having such a hard time. Look, you want to know how broken the thing is? You know, my second book I wrote was The Death of Innocence about accompanying two people uh, that were innocent. And you have to, I had to learn how the appeals courts work. I thought, oh, well, all that didn't happen at that trial, all that was hidden, the lie that was told by the jailhouse snitch, all that will come to light because they can have an appeal. But the gates close, you don't get to present all of those appeals. So the man I'm with now, Manuel Ortiz, he's from El Salvador. He is going on 29 years on Louisiana's death row. And there were so many atrocities, things hidden, lies told during his trial. And he hadn't been able to get that truth out and hadn't been able to get it. He had a federal judge finally look at it and she went against him. She went with the prosecution. She didn't buy at all into his arguments where he was trying to show what had happened. She did lift the death sentence. And so now we're gonna see what happens, but he doesn't wanna go into prison the rest of his life. When you're innocent, look, I mean, and since he's always been, he's always taught me, I call him on Nelson Mandela because he's innocent and he's gone through this. But COVID, the COVID restrictions have really, he's spiraling downward because we haven't been able to visit with him. And that loss of that contact is really hard. We talk uh, once a week, do email, but he's really been deteriorating. He's getting fixated on. So I'm, I'm worried about him. It's the first time I've been worried. And what do I learn? from people, you know, you know, the deepest things in life are when things are mutual and not, oh, here's the good nun coming and pouring her compassionate self on the poor prisoners. These are human beings who started out their life, most of them with childhoods that would have turned me into a decal on the pavement. And I get to meet real people undergoing real things and in the company of people who have done terrible things and dealing with the guilt of that, and then seeking forgiveness for, the, for what they did, and meeting their deaths with courage. And uh, God, I can't hold a candle to that. I'm not trying to exalt them. They really did do some terrible things, but to see the goodness in human beings that people are worth more than that one act. And if you take away all my cushions, all my resources, what am I gonna do? I mean, I learned that at St. Thomas. You see these kids, you see them getting sucked into the drugs, get them suck, suck into the whole thing of robbing and so forth, because what's their life gonna be? Working at a minimum, minimum, minimum paying job at McDonald's, so drugs become a sub economy. And boy, you look at what you can make in a week from drugs. You just see them being sucked into it. And, I, and it threw me back on myself. So prisoners, never to touch a doorknob, not to have any agency, and especially you don't want to get sick in prison. You don't want to get sick. You can't even get an aspirin for a headache without huge ordeals to try to get what you need. Because automatically when you get sick in prison, they suspect you're what they call malingering. 
you're just trying to get out of work. You're not sick. Oh, you could have a terrible pain in your stomach. You could have an ulcer or something. You could be in real pain. Automatically not to be trusted. And then if you declare yourself an emergency and they take you, you know, to the doctors and they happen to disagree, then they throw you in the dungeon for 30 days because you must have lied. It is so hard. It is so inhuman. And I don't know how they maintain humor, connection. You know, I don't know how they do it. Prison's a terrible place. And every time I come out of it and get back in the car to drive back to New Orleans, you know, and the freedom, I can get in a car, I can go to a movie, I can order a pizza, I can choose to be with friends and not to have that freedom. I can order a book and read a book that I choose to read. Um, prisons are terrible places. That's why penal reform's gotta be really at the heart of what we do. I, I love to tell the story of this prison I visited in Dublin, Ireland, a woman's prison. And so the warden has taken me in. Right away, you just see inside you know, the, the walls, all this children's play equipment, little tricycles and different play equipment for children. That was the first thing I saw and I went, hmm, this is gonna be different. And right away, the warden said, you know what our problem is in this prison? is the women don't want to leave because talk about restorative justice, life for them. Therapy to help them with the deep wounds that made them choose in bad relationships in their marriages or their relationships with getting into violent relationships, addictions, job training to get job training, education, learn to develop their minds, and they have people to talk to and they have people to care. And the atmosphere is not one of cells, but you have a room like in a dormitory and you got all the helps and you got to be with your children on a regular basis. So we said we had to form an alumni association of the people who graduate because they want to come back and they want to see. I mean, imagine that. If you ever look at Michael Moore's, um, what's it called? Which uh, country will we invade next? And he goes into the prison systems that are in different countries and see how they do things. It's so shocking. And so far away from punish, 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 make you feel pain and dehumanize you further. Anybody else? Yeah, uh, Luana Rosa, would you like to unmute and ask your question? If not, I can ask it. Hi, hello. Hi. Hi, um, Sister Helen, I'm, um, I'm in the UK and I want to ask you that once the US abolishes the capital, uh, capital punishment uh, for once and for all, do you think people will start to understand that we can heal after loss without the need for vengeance? Um, because ultimately our environment and yeah. politics shape the way that we think. Yes, indeed. Yeah, that's, and I mean, we can look at other countries. We can look at your own, for example. And Canada, the very year our Supreme Court put the death penalty back in 1976, Canada abolished it. And the murder rate had been going up and the murder rate started going down. When you take care of the needs of your people, the social fabric, when people have a decent job or when people are able to go to school and they have productive lives, they don't do crimes. They're, or they're much less tempted to fall into addictions. Or, look at the huge opioid crisis we have in this country. Why are people turning to things to try to feel high or try to feel normal? Because life isn't giving them that. But when you're, you're learning, you're educated, you know, in and you have a decent job and you can raise your family. It's like we have to restore the social fabric of this country. Look at all the people we have in poverty. You know what poverty does to you? It drastically reduces choices. And when I lived at St. Thomas, like I remember one time, one 
a woman, Geraldine, and she just said, I want to move my kids out of this neighborhood. They starting to talk funny, man, I'm so scared they're going to get hooked up with these drug dealers. But I can't, I don't have the money to move out of a public housing project and go to another neighborhood with the gentrification that has been happening. We can't afford to go to another place. And we find out more and more that there were actual laws. It wasn't just private real estate people behind the white flight neighborhoods and watch out a black person's are gonna move in. There were actual laws, federal laws that prevented black people from moving into white neighborhoods. I mean, you know, we're learning a lot about this. Poverty reduces choices. You gotta go to the public school. You don't have the money to send your kid to the good Jesuit Catholic school. Uh, and so you're forced then to try to make a living within these parameters. And you see your kids going down the tube and you watch it happening. What can you do? Interesting, just keep looking into this infrastructure bill about you know how education and the education of children from K through 12 is a really important part of the infrastructure of our, of our country. The care of the people which we have never attended to. Because we've always, for 40, 50 years, starting with Reagan, the nine most dangerous words in the English language is you have a problem and government is gonna help you. He called that the most dangerous words. And what knocked the pins out of everything is COVID, which was denied at the top level of leadership expanded out on a lot of the media. COVID doesn't exist, it's a hoax, it's this, it's that, and knocked our country apart. The economy, everything. And so you have desperation and all the pins knocked out, you also have a chance to restructure in a way we never have before. Now we know we need government. The role of government's essential for us. Look at the vaccines. Look at the push now to get the vaccines. If we don't get COVID under control, nothing's gonna be under control. So we gotta get vaccines. So you have the Defense Production Act. You use government resources, get those vaccines to the people, educate the people about the vaccines. So we have that happening. And everybody in their cat is all for that COVID relief bill, look. And it's already spurring the economy. It's even having a global effect on the economy. We need good government. And I think we made a mistake a long time ago. You know, John Locke, great guy in the Enlightenment, some good stuff about individual. He said the role of government was only two things, individual liberty. And in the US, we real big on that, our individual rights, right? Our freedoms. And the other was to defend us from foreign enemies. No positive role that government plays a role in the welfare of the people. Housing, affordable housing, all those kinds of things. Public education, no positive role for government. We have been in a, in a political rhetoric for all these years that government's bad. When government helps people, it makes them dependent. And you had Reagan. This was such a shameful thing. Held up the Cadillac the queen with her Cadillac of welfare, that these people, you give them money, it makes them dependent and they're gonna abuse it. What a terrible, that was right when I went to live in the St. Thomas housing projects and I saw what was happening to people. But look, life happens, things shift. And we are good people. We are good people and we make changes. Changes in the LGBTQ community, understanding. Look at the changes that are happening with understanding there. Are you stunned? Are you comatose? Hey, me, Are you awake? Look, well, we got this precious time. What you got on your mind? Anything, anything. Mackenzie, did you want to jump in? Do you have another question on the queue? 
Uh, I do. Um, yeah, Michael Maltenford, do you do you want to hop in or do you want me to? Sure. Um, hi, uh, Sister Helen. It's such an honor to, to listen to you. It's such a pleasure. Um, one of the, I, I'm wondering what you would like to say about calls for defunding the police. On the on the one hand, you know, you mentioned that part of the reason we can abolish the death penalty is that we have prisons, so we don't need to execute people. So, what is the role of of police and prisons and and and, and what, how do we fix from where we are now? Yeah, well, I mean, that is the huge discussion going on. That was such a, a bad mistake to frame it as defunding the police. That's wrong. Because then people say, you want to do away with the police force? We've got to have police. We've got to have protection, right? It's not defunding. It's demilitarizing the police. Because we need, with mentally ill people. For, police are called in for all kinds of stuff. And we need more community police and have relationships with the community. It has been, I, when I was at St. Thomas, this was in the eighties, witnessed from the front porch of Hope House, two white policemen with Bobby Leonard, who had just taught a class at our adult learning center. He had been in a federal prison in Atlanta for robbing a bank in Washington, DC. He had gone to college, he had gotten an education, he was just giving a talk to the young people in there get, coming to get their GED and urging them to stay in school, came out of Hope House. He was nailing on a tree a, about a meeting of families who had people in prison, in jail. Policemen see him and it's a misdemeanor to harm a plant or a tree that's public property, they use that. They're throwing him against the car and he's yelling to the nuns on the porch, sisters, y'all are my witnesses. I got no drugs in my pocket. They're gonna try to plant drugs on me. And uh, here are two white women go down to the jail to speak up for Bobby so they don't throw him in jail. I mean, big strapping, intelligent black man. He has to have two white women come down there to speak for him so they don't throw his you know what in jail. And uh, it's just gone on a long time. But we have to demilitarize our police. And we have to retrain them in the whole thing of community relationships. And we have to, you know, subdivide the work that you have community policing and you have people trained for mental illness and not always just coming in gangbusters with the guns. And I wanna speak on their side too because they can be in real dangerous situations. They really need to be trained and they need to have what they need as well. But it's just been such a long, long history of police with black people. That's just, I mean, you know, we have a, um, a suburban community, all white for the most part, when black people would come into the neighborhood, they had to have a, a, a green kind of uniform or all that they come into work in people's yards. It was called driving while black or they would have the sheriff out there in Metairie who would just throw them in the clink just for driving into the white neighborhood. So we got a lot of education to go on that needs to go on. And we do need our, our policemen to be trained. We need them to be protected and to have what they need because they risk their lives for us. And uh, so anyway, that conversation's happening. That conversation's out there. Awesome. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Um, Emma, would you like to hop on and unmute yourself and ask? Sure, I'd love to. Sister Helen, it's such a pleasure uh, to listen to you speak and to have you here. So thank Glad you. Glad to be here. Glad My question is more of a, of a personal one as a Catholic myself. You talked about um, what your prayer life looked like when you were more apolitical. I'm curious now if you don't mind sharing how it's changed since you've now been on the front lines of, of, um, of this work. What, um, you know, what, what does your prayer life look like now versus how it looked like before? How has your prayer changed? Yeah, really. It's connected now very much to what's going on in our society. See, Vatican, the Second Vatican Council of the Catholic Church was the first ecumenical or global council that we had 
whose goal was not to condemn some heresy. Catholics were real good at that. The Protestants, I mean, all that exclusion of others since crazy stuff. It was to connect to the modern world and be a participant in it. And Pope Francis has it now, boy, the gospel of Jesus is that we have to be field hospitals out where the wounded are. That's what it really means to live the gospel of Jesus. And so my prayer is changed in that way. My prayer a lot this day, these days is for Manuel Ortiz, who's really suffering and going down and staying close to him. It's also reading with great interest and following the structural reforms are beginning to happen in the country. One of the things that Vatican II invited us to do, to live our faith, look at the signs of the times, look at where the shifts are, look at where we need to do reform and change. Look, follow who's suffering and begin to dig into the systemic patterns. Not so much this individual morality, Am I pleasing to God and am I going to go to heaven? But social sins, social structural inequalities. That's where the gospel of Jesus calls us. I mean, when you just follow a spiritual life that's whole and you get out of ego and out of individual self perfection, everything, and join with other people in community to help change the world, that's the heart. I think of what the spiritual life is about. But to take time, I do, to meditate, to be quiet. I'm dealing with a lot of death because as I've gotten older, everybody else around me is getting older too. And I've lost now, we have five in our family, mom and daddy, and they're gone. My sister Marianne died in 2016. And I just lost Louie, my little brother, to COVID. January 3rd, and and a lot of our sisters. So I'm standing here like on the beach and a lot of the hands are going under in the water. And so I know my own time is not unlimited and I wanna live my life and I wanna live it to the full and, uh, and treasure those that I love. I put a lot about friendship in a river of fire, because we cannot make it without people close to us, intimate friends with whom we can share our real interior, you know, our vulnerabilities are, you know, and to develop friendship. And so I'm being faithful to my friends and, and staying open, awake. And, and where I can put my hand in and help, I go by, you invited me to come, and here I am. I don't do a lot of trying to advertise or where I ought to go. Invitations come to me and I try to respond to those. So you invited me and here we are together because you asked me to come. Anyway, that's a few little things. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sister Helen, for being Thank here. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Yeah, we're coming to the end of our time. So do you have anything that any final word for us or any information about, you know, how we can how we can find you? Um, one of the things I'm doing is uh, with this book, I, I, I built this module about going deeper. This is more along the line of uh, spiritual meditation and, and deepening understanding. And so what we do is I do an introductory Zoom before you read the book. It's for invitation. Anybody wants to do it. it can be 10 people, 12, whatever. And But the heart of the experience is the quiet reading of this book, which is my journey, which take you through the, uh, the different parts of my life and the awakening on, on awakening. And I give you journal prompts, encourage you that while you're reading, see a text is never a neutral thing. Sometimes we read a text, but sometimes a text reads us. It calls out to us. It can inspire us. It can challenge us. So I encourage you as you're doing the reading, the silent, quiet, your reading of the book to take notes like field notes of your own 
journey. And I have provided journal prompts for you as you do it. And then our final session together is that then I do a Zoom with you, anything that's arisen, insights, questions, and we do that together to end the experience. So it's totally up to you. So, uh, and, and it ends up, of course, about being an activist and not just a participant standing on the sidelines and watching history roll by, but being a participant in history. <clears throat> so Jennifer, I could turn it over probably to you. And if anybody's interested, we could do it together. Thank you so much. Yeah, so we'll send a, um, you're all on our email list and we can send a follow-up email about this. Um, and, um, you know, we can, we can facilitate this. We'd be happy to do that. Okay, so, great. Uh, all right. Well, look, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. It's really Scott. great to be with you. Yeah, all of you. You all can unmute yourselves and say thank goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much for being here. Thank, thank you. you so thank much. You. Thank, thank you. you. I love that. Bye, Sister Helen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. 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 Wonderful. Inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for joining us. Yes. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.